Thank you. Thank you. So, um, hi, I'm Ivan. I work at Google Project Zero. Uh, we do security research. We try to make zero-day attacks hard. Uh, now, I don't want to be uh, talking too much about myself today, uh, but uh, if you want to, to know more about what I do, uh, or if perhaps you'd like to start doing security research but you don't know how, feel free to talk to me after the, after the talk. So, uh, now let's talk about web browser security. And before I get started, I, I have a bit of a confession to make, and that is that the techniques presented in this talk are not going to be anything new. They are, in fact, quite old and, and quite well known. Uh, but in my defense, that, that is kind of the point of this talk. Uh, to, take, uh, to take an old um, and, and well-known uh, bug hunting technique, which is the DOM fuzzing, and see uh, if we can still find uh, good bugs with it in, in, the, modern, in the modern browsers. Um, so, uh, so, so while the techni techniques themselves are going to be old, the issues you're going to see in this presentation are going to be real issues affecting real browsers that are being used to the, today. So right, so let's talk about web browser security and why would we talk about web browser security at all? Specifically, why would we talk about web browser zero days? Well, uh, one possible reason why is because if you make yourself or your organization a target interesting enough for, for advanced attackers, well, then there is a good chance you're going to get owned by a browser vulnerability. Uh, and. Uh, of course, that's not science fiction. We've seen that happen in, in the wild. Um, so I have a couple of examples here. So for example, we've seen a mobile safari vulnerability being used against uh, a human rights activist. We've seen a uh, Firefox bug being used against Tor browser users. We've seen several Internet Explorer uh, vulnerabilities being used in targeted attacks. And, and these are just from, from, from the last year or so. And these are just uh, the ones that we actually know about. So, in fact, uh, what we might be looking at here is just the tip of the iceberg. So, right, now let's look at the, sp at, at the specific part of web browsers, which is DOM. Uh, so, what is DOM? Well, DOM is, is W3C standard, which defines a set of objects that the browsers need, need to implement. So, if you, if you, take, if you take a look at, at the slide here, you're going to see uh, some of the objects on the, in the image. If you, and if you know anything about HTML, then these objects shouldn't be anything new to you. So these are like uh, your standard HTML elements, but the DOM doesn't really uh, define only those types of objects. There are various other types of DOM objects such as uh, attribute nodes, style sheets, event, no, event objects, etc. Uh, and besides just defining the objects themselves, the, the DOM also defines how these objects may be scripted. So uh, at the bottom of the slide here, you have, you have a simple example where we are essentially uh, generating a new element and then assigning a property to it. Right, so uh, each browser basically needs to uh, basically needs to have a component that, that implements all of these DOM objects uh, together with their, their properties and methods. And uh, this component of, of the browser is called a DOM engine. And historically, DOM engines have been a great source of browser vulnerabilities. And uh, that is, of course, not to say that they have been the only source of web browser vulnerabilities. In fact, there have been many others, such as plugins, scripting engines, etc. Uh, so keep the, that in mind throughout, the, throughout this presentation, that, that you won't really get the whole picture of a browser security. You're going to get only uh, information about uh, a, a part of it. So in fact, you, you might not see the, the whole elephant. You might see a significant part of the elephant, perhaps the trunk, but not the whole elephant. Right, so how do these uh, DOM vulnerabilities actually look like? And here I have a small example, which is a code that, that, triggers, uh, that triggers the bug that was used against Tor browser users. Uh, 
And uh, we won't be going into the details of, uh, of, of the vulnerability here, but what I want to draw your attention to is the general structure of the sample that triggers the bug. So as you can see here, we have a snippet of HTML code. In this case, it has an embedded SVG image in it. Uh, there is also some JavaScript code in the uh, on-click handler. And, um, and so uh, this is typically the, the general structure of these samples that, 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 that trigger DOM vulner vulnerabilities. You have, you have some HTML code, you have some JavaScript code, uh, and in some cases you also have some CSS code. And none of this is, is, is actually malformed. Um, it's actually, for the most part, correct, but it is put together in such a way uh, that you wouldn't commonly see on a web page. So when we are talking about DOM fuzzing, we're essentially talking about creating samples such as this that, that create uh, random snippets of, of uh, HTML, uh, JavaScript, and CSS code uh, that, that are synth syntactically correct, for the most part also semantically correct, but are not something that you would commonly see in a web page. So uh, how do we do that? Well, my general approach to fuzzing is to essentially always create my own fuzzer. And that might seem counterintuitive at first, but whenever I create my own fuzzer, I'm going to, I'm going to do something different that, than what is already out there. And it might be a very small thing, uh, but that very, very small thing might have a butterfly effect, which might, which might cause my fuzzer to generate uh, certain samples with with greater probability and enable my fuzzer to, to, uh, to discover bugs that uh, other fuzzers might have overlooked. Or it might happen that I just, just like writing fuzzers, so uh, yeah, uh, pick the actual reason. So uh, for this project, for this piece of research, I created a new fuzzer which we call Domato, uh, and it is generation-based, which means that it always generates a new sample from scratch and it is also grammar-based, which means uh, that it generates the sample based on a set of grammars. So here you have a, a small example, a simplified example of, of, uh, of a CSS grammar that, well, generates CSS code. Uh, and, and so if, if you're familiar with, uh, with CSS, uh, this should be fairly readable. So uh, CSS is basically, uh, CSS code basically consists of a set of rules. Uh, and each rule uh, uh, contains a selector part followed by a declaration part enclosed in, in uh, curly brackets. And then the selector part can, can, can refer to various HTML elements such as anchor element or an audio element. And the declaration part consists of, of, uh, of a list of properties. And these properties can be, for example, background property or border property. And each of them have their, their values. So, so I think... Uh, the grammar syntax here should be should be rather uh, uh, straightforward to read. So you have a set of symbols which are enclosed in in angle uh, in angle brackets, and you, def you 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 tell the fuzzer how each of these symbols may be expanded, and one symbol can uh, can of course include other symbols in its rules, and then the, those symbols are basically expanded recursively. Uh, so I showed you a CSS example. Can we use the, the same technique to, 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 to generate HTML? Well, yes, uh, only minor, uh, minor quirk here is that, uh, that I'm using angle brackets uh, as, as kind of uh, characters that, that have a special, a special meaning in the context of, of my grammar syntax, and HTML does as well. So we need to, uh, we need to escape them. Uh, so in this case, you'll notice that I'm using LT and GT symbols, and these are built in uh, into the fuzzer, and they evaluate to, to greater than and a uh, uh, less than and greater than uh, character, respectively. And these are just uh, some of the, the built-in symbols. There are there are others as well. And interestingly enough, we can use pretty much the same basic principle to to generate programming language code as well. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we uh, essentially tell the fuzzer, hey, uh, now I'm going to write uh, programming language lines and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, 
to write them between the begin lines and end lines statement. And then um, anything in between can be potentially output by the, by the fuzzer as, as a programming language line. The fuzzer is going to uh, select one line and, and, at, at random, uh, more or less, and, and, uh, and fill it out. Uh, and uh, one other addition here is you can see that some of the symbols have a new attribute in them, and that essentially instruct the, instructs the fuzzer, hey, instead of, uh, instead of gener generating a, a symbol of the specified type, instead just uh, create a variable of the specified type here. And then that variable can be included in subsequent programming language lines, and one variable can be included in, mul in multiple uh, language lines afterwards, which uh, contributes to, uh, to, to generating more interesting samples. So as you've seen, uh, grammars are kind of big part of my father. Uh, so how do we actually uh, create those grammars? Uh, well, in the past, I've experimented with various approaches, such as uh, manually just writing them or automatically extracting them. Uh, but for this particular project, I used a hybrid approach where I started with a set of grammars that were automatically extracted. Uh, so for example, from Chrome IDL file, files, which contains information about JavaScript interfaces, and from uh, Chrome layout tests, which, from which I extracted uh, um, uh, HTML properties, CSS properties, and uh, SVGs pro yes, SVG properties as well. So I started with this automatically extracted set of grammars, but then I did manual pass over them to try to improve them as, as much as I can. Uh, and and one, one example where uh, this kind of makes sense is, uh, is given here. So for example, an automatically extracted grammar might tell you that HTML input element has a, property, uh, has a type property which takes a string, but not any random string makes sense in the context of this property, that there are in fact uh, a, limited, a limited number of strings which, which make sense in, in this context. Um, so that's one example where, uh, where an automatically ext extracted grammar might need f improvement. Uh, and we're not quite done here. There, there are a number of other features that DOM fuzzer needs to, uh, needs to support in this day and age to, to be able to find interesting samples. Uh, but I won't be going into, into each one of these in detail. Instead, uh, I'm going to share the good news with you today, and that is that this fuzzer is in the process of being open sourced. It should be open sourced really soon. I'm aiming for next week, but I can't make any promises. Uh, but in any case, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be open sourced fairly soon, and then you would be able to play with it and uh, modify it as, as you see fit. Uh, so uh, how do the how do the the, the samples generated by, by my father actually look like visually? Well, in most cases they don't look like much. I have to admit, but it's uh, in some cases they uh, they uh, they produce samples that are quite uh, visually appealing once rendered in the browser. So well, uh, I guess if my career in information security ever fails, I might try to frame one of these and uh, sell it off as modern art. Um, and also, if you, if, you, if you ask me how some of these samples uh, were generated by, by the fuzzer, I would have absolutely no idea. Uh, and I think that's, that's the beauty of fuzzing. Right, so now that we have a fuzzer, let's test it, right? And uh, we decided to test it against five of the most commonly used, used web browsers out there and each of the browsers have their own uh, DOM engine, which you see uh, in the brackets. And we tried to, to, to give each of these browsers an equal treatment. Uh, so we decided to give each of the browser 100 million iterations of the fuzzer. And 100 million iterations might sound like a lot. And in some sense it is. For example, if you just want to fuzz on a single machine, and if you assume that a single iteration is going to take you 10 seconds, and keep in mind that, that, that the samples generated by my fuzzer can be quite large, then you would come to a fuzzing time of around 32 years. 
so of course you wouldn't do it that way. Uh, but if you have a fuzzing cluster of, say, 300 machines, then the, then the same number of iterations would take about a, a month or, or, or a bit over a month, and uh, that's, that's more realistic. Uh, so how much, how much 300, uh, 300 machines for a month would cost you? Well, I did some calculations on, uh, on, on Google Compute Engine. And, and it turns out that uh, if you use the, the, weakest, uh, the, the weakest available virtual machines, then uh, you would be able to uh, you would be able to do that for about a thousand dollars. And that might be a lot for a hobbyist, but if we are assuming advanced adversaries whose budget measures in millions or possibly billions of dollars, or if if you're uh, if you're selling exploits for hundreds of thousands of dollars, then a thousand dollars doesn't seem like such a large investment at all. Um, so how did we actually test those browsers? Uh, Google Chrome was probably the easiest because uh, Chrome security team has their own fuzzing cluster, which is called cluster fuzz. Uh, and essentially all I needed to do was upload my fuzzer to cluster fuzz and then it it magically works. Uh, story done, happy end. Uh, Firefox and Safari we fuzzed on internal Google infrastructure, which is, which is Linux based. Uh, and you might be wondering at this point, well, how did I fuzz Safari on Linux because Safari doesn't run on Linux? Uh, well, essentially what I did instead of fuzzing Safari was to fuzz WebKit GTK Plus. And WebKit GTK Plus uses the same DOM engine as Apple Safari, and then I, uh, I, I, I verified each of the crashes I reported uh, against, uh, against the Safari build that was actually running on Mac. Um, IE we fuzzed on, on, uh, on Google Compute Engine on a cluster of Windows Server 2012 machines, and Microsoft Edge was kind of the most difficult because we couldn't run it on Google infrastructure, at least not easily, uh, 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 because, uh, because uh, um, Edge only runs on Windows 10. Windows 10 still doesn't run on, uh, at this point on, on, on Google Compute Engine, and unfortunately Windows Server doesn't support Edge. So what I did instead was um, to fuzz Edge on Microsoft's own cloud, uh, which was which was kind of interesting when when the people from from uh, Microsoft Cloud Support called me and asked me, uh, "Hey, uh, what are you uh, what are you using our our uh, cluster for?" Uh, right. So uh, in addition to that, uh, we made uh, some build or configuration changes to those, those fuzzers to be able to. Uh, to, to, to catch bugs more easily. And in the case of, of, of browsers where, where we could make our own builds, that, that basically meant building with sanitizer. So, so Firefox and, uh, and WebKit were, were built using ASIN sanitizer, and uh, Chrome on cluster was already runs built with, with various sanitizers. Uh, for IE and Edge, obviously, we didn't have our own builds, but uh, what we did was to enable uh, to enable page keep for, for the relevant processes, which kind of serves the same purpose. And we also made sure that the garbage collector in each of these, uh, each, each of these browsers gets called periodically, uh, which is important to catch use after free issues, which are quite common in web browsers. So finally, here are the results expressed uh, as the number of bugs. And I'm going to uh, spend some time on, on this slide, but before I dive into the results, uh, I want to say two things. Firstly, all the bugs you see here are uh, security bugs. So in case the, 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 the fuzzers found some other type of issues, like issues that would affect only, only the browser stability, but wouldn't necessarily have a security impact, these aren't counted here and also only the bugs that affected the, the real released stable version of, of the uh, browsers 
uh, mentioned are, are counted here. So for example, if we fast against a development build of, of the browser, we made sure that the, uh, that the bugs uh, were, were actually working against the released version of the browser before counting them here. Right, so now let's look at the results. And uh, my general impression is that most browsers actually did quite well. Uh, because if I use the same methodology three or four years ago, my impression is that I would be getting probably an order of magnitude more issues. So I think that that shows uh, that shows a clear progress for the most part. Now, uh, and also uh, the differences between the browsers are quite small. So you really can't say that one browser did worse than the other because one browser had two more bugs because that difference is just not statistically uh, statistically significant. So please don't don't make such claims based of based on my talk. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, there is a browser that kind of clearly stands out from the rest in terms of number of bugs, and that is uh, Apple Safari. That is uh, its WebKit DOM engine, and that is kind of. Uh, kind of interesting for several reasons. One of those reasons is that uh, we know that advanced attackers are very, very much interested in the Apple's platform. Uh, and the other reason is that up until a couple of years ago, uh, Chrome and Web and Chrome and Safari used the same DOM engine, which was WebKit. And then at some point there was a split and uh, Chrome team uh, created their own fork, which they call Blink. And now there are quite significant differences that, that, that indicate that either uh, in the meantime, uh, the number of, of bugs in Blink got uh, significantly reduced, or that, the, uh, or that there was a number of new bugs that were introduced in WebKit, uh, or some combination of the two. Uh, and uh, but I, I really don't want to uh, don't want this presentation to be seen as as Apple bashing. Uh, so so instead, uh, I asked myself, well, what can I do to improve the situation? And one thing I did was uh, to contact Apple uh, as, as soon as the, the, the results the results start, start started popping in, and I told them. Uh, hey, I'm fuzzing uh, browsers, WebKit is not doing so great. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in sharing my tools, I'm interested in sharing my methodology. Uh, methodology. So, so uh, long story short, uh, now they have uh, a copy of my fuzzer, so, so I, I really hope they use it to, to, uh, to make the situation better. And as I said again, I think most, uh, most browsers did uh, quite well. And uh, there, there are various reasons for that. So for example, uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Internet Explorer and Edge use this mitigation for use after free vulnerabilities, which is called MemGC. And, uh, and there is actually a registry flag with which you can disable this mitigation. And then when you disable this mitigation, what you see uh, is a bunch of other issues popping up. Uh, but of course, uh, this mitigation is not disabled in, in the real configuration, and uh, there are no, there, for, 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 the, for the most part, there are no uh, obvious bypasses. So, so this is kind of the example of, of a mitigation that, that, that really works and is, uh, and is really useful. So uh, now when that is over with, let's look at the fun part, and uh, the fun part are the actual bugs. So, so here I have an example, and uh, it's interesting for uh, it's, inter it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons. One reason why it's interesting is because it is uh, is because it is uh, a vulnerability that affects two browsers, which are Chrome and WebKit, and this means that this is a pretty old vulnerability that that must have been introduced prior to the. Uh, Prior to the Chrome and 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 um, prior to the sorry prior to the Blink and WebKit split, um, and the other reason why it's interesting is 
that there are basically uh, two separate issues here. Uh, but before I go into the, into the details, uh, I, I first have to go over some background. Uh, so in the DOM, there is something which is called a shadow DOM. Uh, and the shadow DOM essentially enables you to implement one HTML element uh, using a set of existing HTML element, elements. And there is a special type of shadow DOM, which is called the user agent shadow DOM. Now, the property of the user agent shadow DOM is that um, the JavaScript code running on the web page should, be, should never be able to modify it. Uh, now, uh, what you have here is, you can see in the, in, in the, uh, in the sample code that I have a keygen element. Uh, and if you don't know what a keygen element is, it doesn't matter. I included uh, a small image on this slide. And as you can see, it kind of looks like another HTML element, which is the select element. And in fact, that is exactly how it is implemented in, in, in WebKit and Blink. So you have you have a kitchen element, which has a user agent shadow DOM, which contains a select element. And what happens in the JavaScript code uh, here in this page is that basically character range from point function in this particular situation, it uh, gets you, uh, get, get, gets you uh, an, an object uh, that you can use to, to modify the user agent shadow DOM, which as I said before, you, you, you never should be able to do. Uh, and then what happens after that is that the father basically prepends a text node in, into this shadow DOM. And what happens after that is that the web browser assumes that the first element inside the shadow DOM is going to be a select element. So it's just going to take it and blindly cast it into a select element but it is no longer select element because we, we changed it. It is now, it is now uh, a text node element. So we are casting a text node element into a select element. So this is a type confusion vulnerability. Uh, and so what I mentioned before is that there are kind of two separate issues here. The, the, uh, the first one is, is getting into the user agent shadow DOM. The second one is, is the type confusion. And the type confusion part you can actually really easily see in the source code uh, because it's just, it's just blindly casting whatever element to a, to, a, to a select element. However, you really can't reach uh, this type confusion vulnerability un unless you're also able to, to modify the, the, the shadow DOM. Uh, and, uh, and why caret range from point in this particular instance uh, returns you a shadow DOM is very, very not easy to see from by looking f at the source code. Uh, and in fact, there are, an, there are a number of other elements that I implemented using Shadow DOM. Well, uh, it turns out that it, this only ever worked in, in the combination uh, with the keygen element. So I think this is a pretty good case for uh, why fuzzing is important, because you can find these vulnerabilities that are that are sometimes quite difficult to, to, to see from the source code. And you can also catch vulnerabilities that only ever manifest uh, when, uh, when, a cert, when a certain set of, of, uh, of conditions are, uh, are true. Uh, and I have a bunch of other bugs here. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip over them. But these are all public. You can find all of these in the Project Zero bug tracker. Uh, so if, uh, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to look at them, feel free to analyze them, see, uh, see what issues they triggered. So right, uh, let's jump to the conclusion now. Uh, and so uh, despite the DOM fuzzing being, being uh, really old and, uh, and quite well known technique, it can still find interesting bugs. Uh, that's kind of the, the bad part. The good part is that uh, while it does find bugs, it, it finds less bugs than it, uh, than it used to. Uh, and, also, and, and that in itself, in itself forces um, bug hunters to look, uh, to, to, to do more uh, 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 manual review. And 
that is a good thing because manual review has a, has a higher ba barrier to entry if we're talking about advanced attackers. So, uh, so what can you do? If you're, uh, if you're a browser render and you're not fuzzing your browser code, you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, how not to have such a bad time? Well, uh, do fuzzing at scale, do fuzzing using multiple fuzzers, because for example, I, I, I really don't believe that WebKit folks don't fuzz WebKit. I, I think they do, but either they are not doing it at, at, at the large enough scale or uh, the fuzzers they are using have uh, blind spots and realistically all fuzzers do. And that it, of course it extends to mine. So if you find some blind spots in my fuzzer, uh, please let me know. Uh, if, you are, uh, if you are a browser user or if you're in a position to, to select a browser for your organization, uh, please try to make an informed decision, which uh, I realize is very, very difficult because there is just not uh, that much objective information out there. Uh, and I think this is, this is uh, an area where uh, security community can do a better job by, uh, by, by, sh by sharing uh, that kind of information. Uh, and of course, if you, if you are a security researcher, you can help by, by, by reporting bugs to, to the vendors. And as I said, uh, my father is getting open source, so feel free to play with it, feel free to modify it. And if you find, uh, if, if you find something that, that, that enables you to find more bugs, please report them to, to the browser vendors. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm, I kind of ran out of time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defer to, to the organizers whether we have uh, time for questions or not. But in any case, thank you very much for listening. Okay, seems like we have time for questions. On, on what? Uh, Tor uh, browser. My insights. My my insights on, on Tor browser. Wow. Um, so this is kind of a complex questions uh, question, and I think there are kind of two issues. You should be very careful with with the with the Tor browser. Uh, one issue is that uh, that it is it is based on Firefox. And, uh, and Firefox at this time uh, doesn't have uh, a, good, uh, a good sandbox. So in fact, uh, you pretty much at this point need, need only, uh, only one vulnerability to, to own Firefox, whereas for, for, for the other browsers you, you need to. Uh, I, I know that Firefox folks uh, did do some work on the sandbox, but I'm not sure at which stage it is. And I also know that, that, uh, that, that the Tor browser folks kind of uh, 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 um, created uh, a sandbox of their own, uh, but it was kind of easily breakable at that point, so it's kind of young. Uh, give it more time and perhaps it improves. Uh, now, now the second, the, se the second issue uh, I, I have with the with the Tor browser is well, uh, how how difficult it is to find a bypass which 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 will not be a browser vulnerability, but which we, which will be something that would uh, that would. Uh, that would basically allow the browser to uh, to bypass Tor and co contact to a resource directly. So that's that's kind of uh, uh, my my worries with, with regards to to Tor browser. And uh, if if you're running a Tor browser, uh, my my advice would be to to run it inside a virtual machine, which which both uh, adds another layer. On, 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 on top of the browser, assuming of course your virtual machine is up to date. And, uh, and, and also that the virtual machine, if you configure the virtual machine that it, that, so that it can't access anything 
other than, than the tor uh, then it kind of might uh, might might add uh, to your protection against these uh, tor by bypasses that i mentioned So I'm 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 not I'm not an expert on tails. I'm I don't know how vulnerable it is, so I wouldn't make any any, any claims whether to 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 support it or or not support it. Uh, that, that, that is a great question. So how did I triage crashes and how did they determine which are security bugs and which are not? Uh, well, in the cases where, uh, where I had the, 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 the sanitizer builds, it's quite easy because the sanitizer actually uh, is, is actually able to, to recognize what type of issue it, it is. So for example, you have use after free issues which are potentially which potentially have security impact. You have uh, you have uh, out keep out of buffer out of bound issues which potentially have security impact. Uh, so it's, it's 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 pretty easy to to recognize this just from the sanitizer report. Uh, in the case of of uh, of browsers where uh, that, that, that weren't run with sanitizers. Well, uh, in those cases, well, what, 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 you in, what you end up getting in practice when you, when you fast browsers are essentially uh, a large number of null pointer dereferences. And these are kind of, uh, kind of easy to, 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 to spot and, uh, and automatically triage as well. Uh, and then, Anything that isn't a null, null pointer dereference, but that is only going to be uh, a, a relatively small number of issues. You can you can essentially uh, triage manually to to determine the security impact. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, I use ASAN ASAN because I I, I think it's it's a, it's, a, it's a de facto standard for for these things. Of course. Yours, yep. And uh, several browsers have similar vulnerabilities. So is there perhaps a database of, I would say, let's say, use cases, test cases, that if you're a, a browser vendor, you could use instead of using multiple uh, browsers in order to regressionally test your new versions of browser? Right. So that's, uh, that, that, that's a great question as well. So uh, if we can. Uh, so considering that we have bugs that, that affect multiple browsers, can, can, we, uh, can we use tests to, 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 uh, to find bugs in, in one browser using tests from, tests from the other ones? And uh, well, yes, uh, that, that happens. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if the, if, if, the, if, the, if the browser vendors do it, though. Uh, if not, they probably should. But I am aware of, of a couple of security researchers who, who, did, who did exactly that and were able to find interesting issues, issues that way by taking, by, taking, uh, by taking essentially tests from one browser and then running it against another browser. Well, okay. Um, so the, the the first question is how to get in, into the browser fuzzing, and um, well, you can you can you, you can you can. Uh, I, I guess I guess a good way to start is uh, that, that, that 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 question would kind of take a long time. But but I guess how you can start is uh, is is looking at what other people are doing, 
And as I mentioned, the, the, the browser fuzzing is not a new technique, and other people are doing it as well. So uh, you, you would be able to find other presentations on, on DOM fuzzing as well. So take a look what other people are doing. Uh, take a look at their fuzzers if, if, they're, if they're available. Uh, and, and, and by just looking at what they do and looking at vulnerabilities, you might have some ideas of your own. So, 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 so try to implement them and, uh, and try to see um, how, 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 how well it works. Uh, what was the, the second question, sorry? Genet genetic algorithms. So I didn't, I didn't really experiment with genetic algorithm, uh, algorithms. What I did experiment with, and what I think is kind of um, might happen in the future, uh, I experimented with coverage-guided DOM fuzzing. Uh, so basically, um, kind of AFLE principle, but but with mutations that that, that are specific that are specific to DOM. Unfortunately, in my experiments, I didn't really uh, find uh, bugs that I wouldn't find using your ordinary DOM fuzzing, but it is perhaps possible to do it in, in a better way that I, than, that I have been doing it. And I think uh, whoever finds a way to, to, to include coverage information into, uh, in, in, a meaning, in a meaningful way, way in DOM fuzzing might be uh, the next king of uh, uh, DOM vulnerabilities. Uh, are we out, out of time? Okay, uh, we are way, probably way out of time, time but thank you.